Hey students, welcome to Sustainable Energy. I'm Rudi Schlaf, a professor in the Electrical Engineering Department at USF. This is part one of the carbon-based energy segment. In part one we will discuss Hubbard's peak theory, we will discuss energy return on investment, and we will discuss energy security issues. Okay, let's discuss the finality of resources. First, let's have a look at the Hubbard peak theory of finite resources. These two figures are from a paper that was published in 1956 by uh, Hubbard. Uh, he was a geoscientist working for Shell, and he predicted that uh, finite natural resources would be extracted following an approximate Gaussian curve. And so in, in his paper, he predicted at 1956, so we're here, um, a curve for the United States and he made some assumptions here whether um, uh, about the degree of approved reserves that we have in the uh, country and so he drew these two curves as minimum and maximum. It turned out that this curve actually very precisely predicted the uh, peak of conventional oil in the United States. It's interesting to examine why we get a Gaussian uh, distribution for the uh, production rate of a resource. That has to do with the fact that consumption correlates with discovery. So we see here cumulative discovery. This is the dotted curve and um, we see here the uh, cumulative production which uh, correlates basically with use of the resource and we see that this is actual data we see that uh, the uh, production slash use curve follows closely the uh, production curve that has to do with the fact once we uh, find a new resource and we figure out how useful it is then we develop use patterns and that creates a market for the resource which then inspires more um, discovery and so uh, the discovery curve just tries to stay ahead of the consumption curve. Now this graph ends here in about 2005, but if we look at the theoretical curve, if we assume we have a finite resource, uh, then of course that means this cannot go on forever at this slope and at some point we will run out of the resource and discovery will come to an end and that then uh, brings the cumulative discovery curve uh, into a plateau. And so um, will the, con the cumulative uh, consumption or production, right? At some point there is just nothing to consume anymore and so we reach a constant value of the total amount of uh, consumed resource. So if you look at these curves here, if you take the derivative, then um, this looks very much like a Gaussian curve that would come uh, out of it. Now let's have a look at the US oil peak. Uh, here in this graph, uh, this is from the Energy Information Administration, um, you see this, this blue curve and this is the million barrels per day uh, US uh, oil production rate. And so you see that this is pretty much the predicted uh, Gaussian curve and it peaked here in about 1970. And we also see a little peak here. This is when a big Alaskan uh, oil field came online. So you see already that each oil field or each each production region has its own peak. So if you have several oil fields then you have several of these peaks superimposed to each other. We also see here this red curve. This is the amount of foreign oil that's being uh, imported and you see it's uh, nicely correlated with our own curve, with our own production curve. If our own production goes down the import goes up. And so after this Alaska peak production went down and the imports went up and so around uh, 2006 or so this trend started to reverse and this was the onset of the fracking technology so we call this here the conventional oil peak and now we started essentially a new oil peak which is related to unconventional oil in fact I found a more recent set of data uh, that's also from the Energy Information Administration, but it's not included in this graph yet. And so here we cover actually from 2010 to uh, 2013, and there's uh, even a prediction for 14. 
And so you see that the oil production in the United States is or has actually recently uh, uh, surpassed the uh, imports. So the imports are now lower than our own production. So all of this is coming from the development of shale oil and other uh, unconventional oil sources in the US. Of course it's obvious this new peak that will also at some point come down again. The question is of course how big is this peak? So that's difficult to assess at this point. It's interesting to compare the uh, United States output um, since the onset of fracking with, the, with other major um, oil producers. And so in this graph we compare the American uh, output, it's in barrels per day, in millions, uh, with uh, Saudi Arabia and um, Europe, uh, Central America and South America together. And so you see here that um, the US just uh, surpassed um, uh, either one of them and it is predicted that in one or two years uh, we may actually be the largest oil producer in the world for some time. For some time it, this means that of course because we're going through a peak this will also plateau and then go down again. The question is when the plateau occurs. So the um, Energy Information Administration uh, I believe puts that point right now to about 2020. So that's not too far in the distant future. Let's look at the peaks of some other uh, oil producing regions. Uh, this graph here shows uh, the European oil production which mainly comes from a uh, North Sea oil. Uh, C plus C stands for crude and condensate so this is all the liquid stuff that can be pumped out of the ground. And this is again mi million barrels per day. And so we see here that this peaked in about uh, 1998 and is since then on a downward trend. How about the rest of the world? Well here we see a graph that has a whole bunch of oil producing regions on there and you see that many of these oil fields also already went through a peak and with some of them of course we don't know yet uh, in this graph at least. Here is a chart from the uh, British Petroleum uh, annual report of the uh, world energy from 2013 and so here this is uh, uh, basically curves for the for for each continent and so we see here that um, it, we can't really tell whether the o world oil production is already uh, close to the um, uh, plateau or not. And of course that all depends on technology and how effectively fracking is implemented in the next few years across the world. And so of course this could um, cause this curve to trend upwards for some more time before we find the peak. We just looked at a whole bunch of energy production data and we understand now that um, all these resources are going through their uh, peak. Right in the beginning uh, we develop the resources very efficiently and then use goes up and then we go through a peak until everything is used up. Now in this graph uh, we contrast this information now with uh, energy use projections and this graph comes again from the Energy Information Administration and it shows us the, um, the use history and use projections of the major energy sources that we're using um, over time. And so we see here that nuclear, renewables, natural gas, coal, liquids, so that's the oil, they're all trending up. Um, the increases here, they are between 1% and uh, 3% for renewable coal here is 1.7%. And that clearly means that uh, all of this, of course, increases exponentially. And we need to contrast this with the fact that we have these peaks, uh, which do not project a exponential growth of fossil fuel supplies. That means that at some point in the future, the uh, fossil fuel production cannot keep up anymore with these use curves and then of course we have to find some other means um, to find energy. In order to find out when this uh, time might come when uh, production cannot keep up with use anymore, 
uh, the Energy Information Administration uh, made these projections and these are based on conventional oil. So this can change a little bit because due to the uh, fracking boom, but the principle is clear. So we have uh, scenarios that um, depend on what we assume how much we can produce in total, right? So we have a low ball estimate here, we have a mean estimate and we have an optimistic estimate which is the uh, which are the green curves. And this is contrasted with a certain growth of energy use scenarios. So 0% growth, 1, 2 and 3%. So we just saw in the previous graph that we're that will be somewhere in between here most likely. And so these curves nowadays start here at 2000, that's when this curve obviously was made, this, this graph. And so they, they project what's happening when, this, when uh, production cannot keep up with use anymore and we get a peak. And you see here clearly that depending on what we assume in terms of resources and in terms of growth, uh, we have scenarios that range from a peak occurring in the very near future, maybe in 2020, to um, the drop-off only occurring here well in the next century, if we assume 0% growth and a very um, optimistic assumption of the, of the resources. But it is unavoidable that we will go through a peak at some point in the next 100 years, it appears. Now the most likely moment for peak, it seems based on growth numbers and uh, maybe the fracking boom, so we can perhaps assume the green curves, it will be somewhere here. So we can assume the peak to be between uh, 2025 and 2050 perhaps. So far we only discussed oil. Uh, here's a graph about coal. It uh, shows the uh, projected production in the United States of the three uh, basic types of coal. Um, we see here that uh, the estimate right now is that production might peak around 2080. It's interesting to note that the US uh, has the largest reserves in the world, but the US is not the largest producer, that is China at this point. The uh, peak at 2080, that's of course based on the uh, current uh, use of coal. Uh, if we adopt other uses such as conversion into synthetic liquids, liquefaction of coal, uh, then of course this um, peak could be reached uh, earlier. Okay, so far we uh, talked about resources and how long these resources might last, um, how long it takes until the peak is reached. Another interesting uh, point in this discussion is the energy return on investment, the EROI. And the EROI calculates how much of the energy that we extract from a resource actually makes it to the consumer. And so in this graph here from a paper by Charles Hall, the amount of energy is the width of this band. And so we start out here with a certain amount of energy that is uh, extracted from a source. So that may be oil in this example. And then we consider how much energy it costs to extract the oil, uh, how much energy it costs to refine it, how much energy it costs to transport it. And then uh, in an extended sense of EROI, uh, one can also look at how much energy it costs to actually make the infrastructure that is needed to use the oil. In the end, we have a certain amount of energy that is left over and uh, available to the consumer for use. And so if you look at these various contributions, depending on what one takes into account, uh, there are several EROI numbers that one can calculate. And so the standard EROI is if you just take into account the oil extraction, this would be this loss here. So after that, uh, we have a certain amount of energy left. Then there is the point of use EROI that takes into account extraction, refining and transport. So how much energy does it cost to actually bring the oil to the consumer? There we have several more energy losses. So at, this, at that point we are left with this amount of energy. And then um, the extended EROI that takes into account uh, how much energy it costs to actually provide the infrastructure to use the oil.
Think of driving uh, cars. If everybody has a car to use the oil that is being extracted, then of course we need to provide wider roads compared to the case where uh, everybody would ride a bus, for example, and not have uh, their own cars. And so taking this into account is another uh, energy expense, of course. And so depending on what one takes into account now, one can calculate the ratio between the amount of energy that is left after all these Eroy calculations and the amount of energy that's going into the system. Naturally, the standard Eroy is the best number and then it uh, de declines to the point of use and then the extended Eroy. So in this course, we will mainly consider the uh, standard Eroy that simply uh, uh, relates the uh, cost of producing the energy uh, relative to the energy itself. Here in this slide, you see a comparison between Eroy values of different fuels. We compare coal, conventional oil and gas, unconventional resources like tar sands and oil shale, and also to biofuels, ethanol and diesel from biomass. And so you see that AROI varies dramatically across these uh, six different energy sources. Coal definitely has the best value followed by conventional oil and gas. But when you go to unconventional fossil fuel sources or biofuels, then the EROI drops dramatically and uh, gets pretty close to one which is the point where it costs as much, much energy to extract it as we get from the uh, source. So the message here is, as we run out of the conventional sources and we have to uh, use unconventional sources, then the eroid drops and it will become much more expensive and difficult to produce these energy types. If one considers a particular resource, it is common that the eroid trends down over time. This comes from the fact that usually the more easily accessible parts of a resource are extracted first and then as we start running out more difficult to access parts get extracted later. This is shown in this graph also from this paper by Charles Hall uh, for conventional oil and gas. So this is the uh, global average and while it varies over time, there's a clear downtrend. And so if you look here at the time scale and the Eroy scale, you see that the Eroy actually drops by almost 50% over uh, 15 years. The fact that the Eroy typically trends down for a particular energy resource suggests an interesting impact on the Hubbard peak. We learned earlier that a typical energy resource uh, follows this Gaussian peak shape and initially uh, one is led to the assumption that the decline of the peak is similar to the incline so that we're sort of going through a soft landing uh, as the energy resource runs out. However, if you take into account the uh, decreasing EROI over time, that means that the energy that is available to society uh, as we go through this peak actually drops off much more quickly as we are at the uh, end of this peak because the EROI eats more and more of the energy for extracting the resource and less and less of the energy is available to society. So we don't have a Gaussian peak shape on the on the declining side of this peak, it's more like a cliff if you take the Eroy into account. The consequence of this phenomenon is that as a society, one has less time to react to the decline of the uh, energy resource. One needs to come up with replacement much more quickly because of this much faster drop off due to the falling Eroy. Another important uh, topic to cover when it comes to fossil fuel reliability is energy security. Uh, these two uh, photos were taken during the 1973 oil crisis. And during that crisis, the uh, OPEC uh, or some members of the OPEC uh, proclaimed an oil embargo. That means uh, the imports ceased and that had the consequence that uh, uh, during the embargo, uh, gasoline, for example, had to be rationed. You see here a long line uh, at a gas station. Uh, also, 
the 55 speed limit comes from that time. Uh, you see here two workers uh, putting a new 55 label on top of a previously uh, a speed limit sign that said 70. This here allows to reduce the energy use of cars by about 10%. Another consequence of this uh, embargo was that in March 1974, the price of oil had gone up from $3 per barrel prior to the um, embargo to $12 after the embargo. And that shows you clearly that, that fossil fuel supplies are or can be pretty unstable and that the price can vary quickly. This is shown impressively on this chart, which shows price fluctuations of crude oil prices from 1861 to 2012. The green curve that shows the numbers corrected for inflation in 2012 prices. The dark green uh, curve is the corresponding curve in absolute prices. Uh, so if we look at the at the green, uh, the light green curve, then we see here that uh, before the oil embargo in 1973, the price was fairly constant for quite a long time, and then out of a sudden it shot up by a factor of five because of the oil embargo, and then it stayed constant for a few years, and then it went up by another factor two as the uh, Iranian Revolution unfolded. After that, it dropped almost to previous levels, only to uh, rise again uh, dramatically here during the Asian financial crisis, then the invasion of Iraq, and then the uh, Arab Spring. So we have a pretty wild up and down of oil prices, and of course that makes it difficult for the economy. In fact, this is shown here on this slide, which shows uh, that oil price spikes actually trigger recessions. So every time the oil price goes up, the economy is suffering. And you see this clearly here. The green bars are the uh, GDP growth, while the uh, black curve is the oil price. And so every time we have an oil price hike, the GDP numbers are uh, much smaller than in years with a lower oil price. Okay, this concludes uh, part one of carbon-based energy. In uh, part one, we learned about the Hubbard peak, fossil fuels resources are final. We learned about the shrinking energy return on investment, the EROI, which makes it ever more difficult to extract energy as a particular resource is running out. And we discussed energy security. Thanks for watching.